Hello everyone. Welcome to another reactor stream. Um, it's amazing. So I got this new computer. It's a like a tower and it's got tons of RAM, ridiculous amount of RAM, uh, which allows my streams to be a little bit better. I know they're not perfect. Um, my uh, my internet's not great here, um, but with lots of RAM, I'm able to buffer more, which makes the lag a little bit better and hopefully the, the stream a little bit better. Hopefully y'all can hear and see me okay. Um, I think I've figured out all of my audio issues uh, with this new machine, so we should be good there. Um, so today is our longer stream. We're going to take it slow, relaxed. It's about two hours. Um, I have both Megan and Christopher over in the chat. So if you have any questions, uh, they're there. And um, we've got uh, some interesting topics today. So on Tuesday, we started exploring genomic data from 23andMe. And what we were trying to do was just kind of that very first level introductory, what might someone who is a data scientist or a machine learning person or getting into that, what 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 might they start to do with biological sciences data sets? So the data set that we were looking at was um, uh, SNPs. I now know the correct pronunciation, not SNPs, but SNPs, uh, which is basically locations um, of particular, now I can't remember the word, but like on a chromosome, there's these locations um, of of interesting bits of genomic data. Uh, and they have a particular genotype associated with them. And part of the goal of genomic research is to be able to identify these SNPs and, um, and uh, uh, sorry, I'm just, I got distracted by, no, it is not a repeat of Tuesday. I was just kind of like recapping where we were to kind of frame what we're doing today. Um, so it's uh, basically we were able to um, start to explore like where, which chromosomes and which genotypes these SNPs might be. And that might be interesting information for uh, uh, folks who are doing biological sciences, um, uh, genomics research, sorry, folks that are doing genomics research to be able to start to discover anomalies or um, just kind of like interesting things about certain sequences. If you did miss Tuesday's stream, though, uh, this is not a repeat, but if you did miss it, it will be on YouTube uh, tomorrow. So uh, if one of my teammates can drop the link, it's basically youtube.com slash Microsoft Reactor. Today, though, or sorry, yesterday, we went on to Twitter and my uh, partner happens to be a bioinformatics researcher and he focuses on proteomics. But I wanted to kind of get a sense from him what are the interesting pieces, like what are the actual things that folks in genomics research or proteomics research focus on in that initial exploration? And um, as if I set it up, which I actually didn't, <laughs> I was working on this independently of talking to him, which maybe in retrospect, I should have talked to him more beforehand. Um, but he he actually validated what, what we were doing. So that initial just kind of exploration and creating graphs and things like that, that is actually one of the most important pieces of this research, because typically you have chemists and biologists who are generating data from actual samples. Um, sometimes you use tools like mass spectrometers. So in proteomics, for example, you'll take a, a protein sample, you'll run it through a mass spectrometer, and then that tells you um, just basically a sequence of masses and, and different proteins have unique mass signatures, um, which will then allow you to take an entire sample and say, I can find this protein in that sample, this protein in that sample, and this protein in that sample. And um, as we mentioned, uh, the the um, samples are not always clean. And so sometimes you'll... It, so the samples aren't always clean and the and the mass spectrometer isn't always perfect. And so sometimes what you get out isn't exactly the the right um, kind of shape of the mass. And so you'll have to kind of do like a best fit match to that and say, well, this, you know, mass signature looks in this clip of the sequence looks very similar to the one that's in this database. Um, and it also looks similar to this one. If it was this one, what does that mean? And, and and where might this extra mass be coming from? If it was this one, what might that mean? Anyways, that very initial um, uh, data exploration and being able to visualize this 
complex, just kind of messy data that comes from humans or comes from the real world. Uh, that initial exploration and charting and plotting and all of that, that's what helps the folks who do the coding, bioinformatics scientists, data scientists, machine learning folks, to be able to communicate back with the chemists and the biologists. Um, because you can show a plot and say, this is what I'm seeing. Is that what we're expecting to see? Um, do you detect any anomalies right off the bat that we want to look into deeper? Uh, do you find any, uh, do you notice any gaps? Are we missing something? Is this going to be able to tell us an entire story? So um, if you didn't, if you didn't catch that, we had a like 15 or so minute live it looks okay. There we go. Uh, we had a 15 or so minute live video chat on that. It got a little hectic. It started like hailing and such. But um, then I uh, did a couple of lessons learned. So our Twitter, um, twitter.com slash MSFT reactor. Um, if you go back to our, our Twitter uh, profile, you can check that out. So that leads us to today. Today we're going to explore a little bit further. We're, we're, we're not going to do so much of the like data cleansing and things like that, what we're going to do is take a look at two different data sets and run them through a linear regression machine learning model and a K nearest neighbors machine learning novel model. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. OK, thank you all for for plopping the chat things in the chat there. Um, when I do do these streams, when I'm sharing my screen, I tend to turn off my camera because then I can save on some bandwidth. Um, if I do jump back to kind of a more explanatory, just more talking, I might move back to my camera. So um, let's go ahead, same GitHub for source. Yes, uh, thank you. It is the same. We actually, I moved, um, so if you were here on Tuesday, I did move the data into a data folder, um, but we still have the the work that we did um, on Tuesday in there, and then we have the stuff for today. Awesome. Okay, so I'm gonna open up, let's see. First, let me just intro what we're going to do. Um, we're gonna start by looking at a data set that is uh, mammals, with their body size and their brain size. And when I first was recommended to kind of start checking out this data set, coffee, I started thinking like, why do we care? So I remember the, um, like a while back, I remember folks talking about, uh, you know, does bigger brains actually mean that you're smarter, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I couldn't remember the actual conclusions there. Um, Yes, this is recorded and will be posted on YouTube on Friday, tomorrow. Um, so I started taking a look at why brain size may or may not matter. And I stumbled upon this Smithsonian Magazine article. Um, I'll pop this link in the chat. It's not, um, it's just kind of very high level. But one thing that was interesting is uh, they mentioned, and let me zoom in. We're not going to read it. Don't worry. Um, but they mentioned that. Where did it go? Um, I wanted to highlight this, but uh, basically they determined that the brain size relative to the expected brain size of that body size is what might somewhat correlate with intelligence. Um, so the brain size relative to the body size, that makes a biggest difference. Now, interestingly, if you had have a large body, you're more likely to have a large brain because you just need more brain to be able to move that body basically. Um, so an elephant might need a bigger brain, but it's the relative brain size to um, your body size that might be more correlated. And so what we're going to do today is just kind of start talking about how they might have come to that conclusion and where they might be going. So this is this was an article from from 2013. Um, I'm sure there's much more. I didn't I, I didn't go into more detail on like brain size and stuff. Um, yeah. And I don't know. Small head 
do, do people have big heads with small brains or small heads with big brains and what is the relative size I don't know I actually like after reading this wish that I had like a sample of humans um rather than just a bunch of mammals but that's okay um <laughs> yeah let's let's all uh stop and measure our heads I actually don't even know like I now I'm curious like is there a correlation between head size and brain size not sure um okay so let me pull up the right VS code. Where am I? There you are. OK. Um, I know you all are seeing it, but I was not seeing my right one, my correct one. OK. So what we're going to do today is explore this CSV file. This is the mammals.csv, and it is in the GitHub. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know big versus small. So that's part of what we're going to look at, at here. Um, coffee. <laughs> So in the CSV file, we have a mammal column, a body column, and a brain column. Okay, and you can see that uh, the mammals is basically just the name Arctic fox, owl monkey. Um, and then we have body, and I think, let me try to remember, um, the body size is, oops, um, what we're looking at here, I have the actual link to the data set um, here. So the body is in weight. Oh, there we go. In kilograms. And actually, let me just show you this as well. And then I'll, I'll share this with you all. Um, let me change. I did not get a chance to set up my stream deck. So now I've got to like actually go into OBS and click it. Um, but this, oops, this right here is where we got this data set from. Put the link in the chat. Um, what's her YouTube? Uh, do you mean my YouTube channel? I don't, uh, this is not posted on my personal one, but um, the YouTube channel is for our reactors, which this will be on as well, is this one here. Um, thank you, Christopher, because I, I don't know the conversion of kilograms to pounds. Um, <laughs> so this is body weight in kilograms and brain weight in grams. OK. And then, of course, the common name of the species. So when we're taking a look at let me switch back my OBS to the VS code. There we go. Um, when we take a look at this, we've got uh, body weight in kilograms and brain weight in grams. Awesome. Okay, coffee. <laughs> um, and we can see that we've got not a whole ton. So remember on, uh, oh, and actually I did not move this one into my data thing here, but uh, remember that when we were looking on Tuesday, uh, we were looking at a data set of these SNPs and it was like 900 and something thousand, 966, 900, 966,978 rows. In this case, we've only got um, we've only got 63 rows. But the purpose of this is not necessarily like it's just kind of that initial data exploration again. And we could potentially add in more data sets of like animals that are similar in size and, and things like that. OK, America also uses the metric system, just calculates it for the Americans again. Oh, <laughs> yes. OK, so today what we're going to do is we're going to start to explore this. And the first thing that we're going to do to explore this is take a sip of coffee. Uh, we need to actually get this CSV file into this notebook. Um, for those of you who haven't seen this before, this is Visual Studio Code. It's free to download. And um, I haven't gotten a chance to fully explore the announcements yesterday from GitHub Satellite. Uh, but if you missed those, we do have uh, a new like Visual Studio Code Spaces, um, which I really want to try out. And I really wish I had the time between yesterday and this morning um, to try it out. But uh, if you didn't get a chance to see it, basically it's like an integration into, into GitHub. So hopefully we'll be able to try that out soon in the future. I'm excited for that. But for today, we're in Visual Studio Code. I've installed uh, the Python extension. 
It's the Microsoft Python extension, free in the extension marketplace. And um, I opened up an IPYNB file. And when I opened up that IPYNB file, uh, VS Code prompted me, just like it is here, the marketplace has extensions that can help. It prompted me for uh, the Jupyter extension, which I then just clicked. It, it, this one actually just said install. And so I clicked install. OK. Um, Jupyter Notebooks, basically we've got these cells and we'll be able to write code in these cells and execute them one by one. That will be great because then we can rewrite code and, or sorry, we can rerun cells if we ever want to. Okay, so let's get started on getting our data from the CSV file into here. Again, we wanna do this because um, if, if we left it in the CSV file, we can't do like we would basically need to jump into um, like Excel or something to 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 work with it. And sorry, typing and talking is not a good thing for me. Um, and we, the whole purpose of this is we want to actually run some code on it. So let's bring this in as a data frame. So, oh, you know what? First things first, we need to actually import all of the libraries. We so let me uh, do that first. Good thing I didn't run that yet. It would have, well, you can see what happens. Um, if I run it, it says, what is PD? Because I didn't actually define it. Because what we normally do is uh, just like before, we're gonna import these three. So NumPy as NP, Pandas as PD, and then the matplotlib pyplot as plot. Uh, we're also going to import a bunch of other stuff. So. I'm gonna paste that and you should have this if you're grabbing it from the GitHub, um, uh, it, it'll, it'll be on there. Okay, so let me just organize this a little bit so I can see it better. There we go. So what we're importing here is um, a bunch of modules from scikit-learn and scikit-learn is, sklearn is a Python module. I'm just gonna read this quickly for integrating classical machine learning algorithms into the tightly knit world of scientific Python packages like NumPy, SciPy, and Matplotlib. So basically it's going to allow us to quickly use things like getting the R2 score for the metrics. Um, we're gonna be loading, excuse me, we're gonna be loading in um, the Iris data set, which we'll talk about later. Being able to do k-fold and cross-validation, which is useful for k-nearest neighbors. Um, being able to cluster on k-means, use the k-neighbors uh, classifier, use some linear regression and PCA models, and actually test, split our data between training data and testing data, okay? Um, so we'll grab all those modules should work and uh, you saw for maybe a second there was like little asterisks in this um, in these brackets that means that the cell is still running so if you're ever using VS Code um, or Jupyter Notebooks in general regardless of if it's in VS Code or not um, you can uh, one know whether or not a cell is completed by checking if it has a number there and two know the order in which the cells were run um, because it numbers them which is very important, again, if you're trying to rerun cells, uh, you wanna know in which order they've already been running. Is there a quick way in IntelliSense to know um, the parameter options for plot styles available? Let's try that out. Um, well, let's rerun this real quick. Okay, so uh, yes, we'll try that out in just a second. Um, we, yes, we are going to be uploading every Friday, so, um, we stream throughout the week, typically three or four times a week, and then we upload everything on Friday. Uh, so sorry, I know it's it, that can be frustrating, but uh, if you did wanna watch it, we do still have all of our videos on the Twitch channel as well. So um, let me just show that really quickly. Um, if you, so we're all here, hello, hi. Um, if you head over to videos tab, uh, you'll be able to see right here, exploring genomics data in VS Code. So this is the one that I did on Tuesday. Um, also yesterday, there was a session on cognitive services and face API, which is fun. Um, and then there was a GitHub satellite announcement yesterday as well. Uh, and then this is, this is, I think this is the one we're doing. I don't know why I didn't update the title. I don't, the title's definitely updated. But um, all of our videos from the past like uh, 
two-ish weeks, um, I think it's 10 days until they expire, uh, are here. So if they're not on the YouTube yet, you can always see them here. Okay. And yeah, did we figure out the... Awesome. Okay. So it looks like y'all figured out the um, packages. Yeah. So basically uh, what Christopher said, if you've already um, imported everything, you should be able to see it. And I'll show you that in just a second. Okay. Perfect. So next, what we're going to do is... Um, Actually, one thing that I did want to show you all, I think this is the syntax. Let me try to remember. Um, for example, this, if we ran this, yay. So if you put a question mark in front of the cell and then put the uh, method that you're trying to run, uh, it will give you the signature. And then it'll also give you the doc string. So basically the docs. And then it'll describe all of the parameters for you. So beautiful. So that's the syntax for doing that inside of Visual Studio Code's Jupyter Notebooks. Um, for the IntelliSense, I think if you do this and then you hover, no. Yeah, there you go. Uh, but that's not actually, there we go. Um, yeah, if you like hover over it, um, it does open up this this other uh, kind of like IntelliSense-y pop-up thing. Um, so it's there as well. I like the actual putting the question mark because I feel like it's just easier to read through it all. And that is the same doc information if you were to kind of look it up on, on the pandas docs. Okay, but we have already done that. Um, perfect. So next what we're going to do is, first of all, I mean, what I always like to do is double check that this is bringing in the data that I want it to be bringing in. So let's take a look at the top of this. I just always do this gut check just in case. Um, for example, I want to make sure that it did capture, you know, like the titles of the of the columns or the column names um, and it didn't use that as like values. Uh, it shouldn't ever, but I just so many so many mistakes have happened and I come to find out that the mistakes are because of something simple like that. So um, I always like to like quadruple, quadruple check. We can see that Arctic Fox uh, 3.385, 445, Owl Monkey 480, 15.5. Yeah, that looks all correct. Cool. So before we get started, I mean, I don't know about you, but the whole point of moving it into code is so that I can start to visualize it quickly and start to manipulate it. And, you know, looking at it in this data frame is just the same thing as looking at it in the CSV file. So I'm going to plot this. Let's take a look at what's going on. So the I'm going to plot this as a scatter plot because um, these are basically independent, independent pieces of data. Um, and I want to see the relationship between them. And we're going to try out some linear regression stuff. And so I want to start to see that. So I'm going to take my data frame and I want to plot. Uh, and I want it to be a scatter plot. And I want my x axis to be the column body. And I want my y axis to be the column brain. And I'm putting the semicolon there so I can ignore warnings and such. And it's, cause it's kind of the output. I, I, I just want to see. So when you don't put the semicolon there, it gives you like this little output. And I just, I just want to see the graph. Awesome. So we can see this. This is all of our data points. Remember, we only have like 63, I think it was. All of our data points. Um, one thing that we didn't do that I usually do is do like a mammals.info. Just to kind of like get a sense for it. So we've got... 62 entries, right, because 63 rows uh, with a with a column titles. Uh, no, no null values. Um, we can also do like a mammals.describe to get some of the highs and lows. So we've got a minimum of 0 0.005 kilograms for body weight and 0.14 kilogram or grams for brain weight. Um, maximum, that those must be some elephants right there. Wow, that's like... Wow. Okay. Yeah. Um, and uh, min, you know, it kind of gives you the distribution here. 
So that kind of helps us point to it. I also, you know, we, we do see that we've got these major outliers here. I'm assuming that these are elephants. Again, this is only 63, but still, like, I don't want to go through and, and find that in the data. The whole point is using code. So we can also maybe just grab. So I'm, I'm noticing that um, the, the two biggest outliers here, you could maybe consider this one an outlier, but the two biggest outliers here are these two, and they're over 2,000 kilograms of body weight. So why don't we check? those out and just see who they are. So what I'm doing here is I'm going to grab the location. So basically all of the rows, okay, from the mammals data frame, which is basically our data. And I want to only grab the rows where our body is greater, the value in the column body is greater than 2000. And then let's just go ahead and print them all out. There should only be two. Cool. So our Asian elephant and our African elephant have the body weight that's much larger in the brain weight. That's kind of interesting. The body weight here is like 4,000 kilograms difference, whereas the brain weight is only like 1,000. Um, so I wonder if that's kind of an early indication of anything. So this graph doesn't really tell us a whole lot um, in the sense of like we've just got this big cluster down here. And so one thing that folks in the data science machine learning and, you know, their respective uh, industries, so in this case, biological sciences, one thing that they might do is transform the data so that we can have a better understanding of what is what is happening and what kind of correlations we might be able to draw. And so what we mean by this is we don't want to change the data, right? We don't want to just all of a sudden say like, oh, well, let's just, you know, round these or something like that. That's that's that'd be absolutely changing the data. Um, but what we want to do is we want to start to be able to see like better predict if you are this body weight, what brain weight might you have? And because we have such a huge cluster, it'll be difficult to predict that. Um, so what does anyone in the chat, what do you think we should do? How do you think we might want to transform our data in a way to actually understand like a better correlation or actually see it? Scale the data, log. Cool. All right. Let's try that. <laughs> um, let's bring up the, I just want to briefly show you the um, pandas uh, scatter plot. Let me share my other screen. Um, where is the, oops. Sorry, I think this is actually the one that we want to look at. Um, we can actually change. So this is the plot documentation. Oh my gosh, this, yeah, let's, <laughs> let's zoom in there. This is the documentation for the pandas plot method. And we can see in here that there are some parameters that we can pass in to do this kind of scaling for us. So we can use log scaling for both X and Y. And actually, that's a good question. Do we want to only log scale X, only log scale Y, or, or log both of them? What what do we think? And I'm going to switch back over to the code. It's a log. It's a log. It's a wonderful toy. I Oh, gosh. Oh, gosh. <laughs> both. Awesome. And here's that uh, documentation for you. So let's try that out. We're going to, instead of just plotting all of the values as they are, we're going to plot, scatter plot still, x body still, um, y brain still. Oops, don't forget the equals. And we're going to do log log equals true. Let's try that out. Ah. That's much prettier. <laughs> that gives us more of a line. Um, that gives us more of a uh, the ability to predict 
based on body weight, what the brain weight might be. How can I open IPY file if you've cloned it locally? Yeah, no problem. So if you've cloned it locally, um, all you have to do is go to file. What I would probably do is open folder. Um, so if you open up the folder for where you stored it, then if you have the Python extension installed, so make sure you have the Python extension installed, then all you have to do is click on this, like click on the file, and then it'll start to open it. If you don't have a Jupyter Notebook, um, uh, extension there it'll prompt you and if you do then it should just open and then it'll slowly kind of like trigger the python extension with the jupyter notebook package to open it in this view thank you christopher awesome so now what we can do is actually see if um or actually do some linear regression on this data but we're going to want to do it on our scaled data uh, because that's the one that's going to help us be able to predict better. Okay. So we're going to be using, um, or let's first define our X and Y. So our X is going to be uh, the log, and we can use NumPy here to, um, to get the log of our body column right? Because we want to use body weight to predict brain weight. Um, by the way, why do we want to use body weight to predict brain weight? I mean, it to me, it I didn't like, I know this, but then I never actually thought about it. And then right now I was like, we should actually define why. Um, because it's much easier to weigh <laughs> an animal than it is to weigh their brain, right? <laughs> um, so we, we don't want to, uh, we want to be able to not pull the brain out of an animal, uh, but rather by looking at an animal and weighing them, predict their body or their brain weight. And if we can accurately predict their brain weight, then we can start to do some uh, experimentation with uh, intelligence tests, right? And so then we can say, well, your body weight is this. I predict that your brain weight is this. And if I do this intelligence test on you, then I see this. Um, we actually see that, uh, I think it was in that, um, that Smithsonian article. Uh, this is actually kind of a little bit interesting. Uh, let me just show my face for five seconds. Um, we saw that in the Smithsonian article, I think it was, that uh, wolves and dogs, right? So kind of like wolves in nature and dogs. Wolves tend to be heavier and their brains are actually um, heavier. And dogs tend to be smaller and then their brains are also smaller. Um, I'm not exactly sure if the like relationship between body weight and brain weight is the same in wolves and dogs or if dogs also relationally have a smaller brain um but the interesting thing is that uh wolves had heavier or bigger brains and dogs have smaller ones um and so you can draw your own conclusions uh the they made like some kind of joke in there about how and this is actually true. My my King Charles Cavalier Spaniel, which is like this really long way of saying this tiny little dog that's probably overbred, um, is tiny. And uh, yet he knows how to get me to get him cheese from the fridge without fail every time. So, I mean, maybe he's smarter than I am. Who knows? Um, but that's why we want to, uh, to use the brain to predict, sorry, the body weight to predict the brain weight. Okay. Um, but we do want to uh, also reshape this data. Uh, so then that way it's on a... a um, here, let me bring up the reshaping stuff. Um, I think that's this this one here. Um, we just want to make sure that we're reshaping the data so that it matches uh, the same input that we're giving it. So it's a basically just making sure that it's the same shape as the input that we're giving it. Okay. Um, so two. NumPy, and we're going to use NumPy to reshape this for us. And I'll plop in some documentation uh, on that. Let me grab this. Hello. Hi. Give me you. There you are. That's here. And here. Isn't the point to find the outliers or animals whose brain is significantly bigger or smaller? Um, 
that w what would be appropriate for that body size. Yes, so uh, that could be the point. Um, that's the neat thing about this kind of thing and, and kind of like what we talked about with Adrian yesterday in the Twitter stream is that when we're doing this kind of data analysis and, you know, this is this is something that I'm realizing I wish I would have done in general. Um, I wish I would have had the biological scientist pair with me right now. Unfortunately, I don't have that. Um, uh, in the future, I'd like to do that. Maybe we can start to interview some folks and get some some data sets of get data sets from scientists that are actually working with them and then at least provide some kind of interview with them ahead of time or, or on a YouTube channel or something like that. Unfortunately, we don't have that today. So I'm not a, a biological scientist working with this data in particular, um, which makes this a little bit uh, like contrived example in terms of I don't have an actual question that I'm asking. Um, but you could imagine different kinds of questions. So one type of question, you're exactly right, is to find the outliers meaning not the outliers in your really heavy like the elephants, but the outliers in the difference between the weight of your brain and the weight of your body. Um, but another thing could just be to find the uh, model that accurately represents the truth of what exists. And the purpose of that is um, so then that way, again, if we discover a new animal or some animal, not necessarily a new animal, but an animal that we don't have a brain weight for, um, what we can do with that data is we can measure or we can weigh that animal and then we can predict the brain weight of that. And then that's just kind of like the first piece, because why do we care about the brain weight for that? Next, what we would do is probably have other models that predict, given this brain weight, what kind of intelligence might this animal have? And then that might help us understand what we want to look out for in this type of animal. So if we're maybe going out into the wilderness and actually studying these animals, um, if you were to see this type of animal, this size of animal, then you might know to look out for these types of behaviors versus these others. Again, I'm not a, a biological scientist in this in this respect, um, but these might be some of the the um, uh, examples. And again, I would probably use even more data sets um, and, 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 and analysis to, to answer real world questions. For example, does the weight, does the weight and brain size only correlate to the intelligence or is it also things like, do you have opposable thumbs or, you know, like, um, are you social animals or does the socialness of an animal relate to the brain size, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but yeah, exactly. Uh, finding just different relationships between the data. So this stream is meant to start to spark your curiosity here. We're only looking at one data set. It's a fairly small data set. Um, we don't have an exact answer for what we're trying to find here. But this kind of experimentation and uh, visualization of the data and scaling of it and things like that, that's what will help us then be able to continue our journey and answering more questions. Um, it's actually making me want to just like, choose some random question and then start exploring it on on some random stream but uh these the streams that we do um for the reactors what we're trying to do is kind of give you that initial spark uh not necessarily go through the entire entire process cool uh that's a really great question though i, I and i love the conversation that we're having awesome uh so now we can also grab the y so the y data is going to be np log of the of the brain. So again, what we're doing here is we're trying to use X to predict Y. Now we get to use our handy dandy uh, scikit-learn module. So we're going to grab, uh, we're going to be splitting our data, both X and Y, into testing data and training data. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, train, test, Split x, y, test size equals 30% and random state. Let's just do zero for now. Why not? I don't know. OK, so what are we doing here? Train test split. Basically, what it's doing is it's going to take the x data, so that's our body column, and the y data, our brain column, and it's going to split it 70-30. So 70% of our data is going to be in the X column and 30% of our data is going to be in the, sorry, 70% of our data is going to, is 70% of all of the data is going to be in our training sets. So X train and Y train. 
and 30% of all of our data is going to be in our test. And I described this a little bit um, on another stream, but I like to think about X train, sorry, train test split. The way that I like to think about it is, um, and let me just show my face again, uh, is, is kind of like if you were in school and you had an exam and the the professor provides you with a pretest or like a, a practice test. So that practice test is your training, right? I mean, there's also kind of like notes and the lectures and all of that, but the practice test is your training. And the 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 reason why that's your training data is because those questions are pretty much the same kinds of questions they're gonna ask on the exam. That's the whole point of a practice test, um, but they're not exactly the same. So if you do enough of those, then you're going, and, and you can like compare your, your practice test answers to, to the correct answers, right? So that's our X train is our practice test and you answering them. X test, sorry, X train is the practice test and you answering them. Y train is the actual answers from the practice test. So you can compare those. You can pra keep practicing, right? Get Keep getting better until you get like 100% on your practice test, okay? That's training our model. And then you go and take the actual test. And taking the actual test, that's our X test, where you provide the answers to the actual test. And then the Y test is the professor's answer key. So then they'll basically grade you, okay? And so you could imagine doing this in kind of an iterative process where you, you, you train, 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 take a test, see how well you did. Cool. Um, so that's basically what we're doing here. Why are we going to split our data between 70, 30? Well, we're actually gonna like play around with those numbers a little bit in a minute. Um, but basically what that's doing is just deciding how much of our data we wanna reserve for testing and how much we wanna reserve for training. And then random state is deciding basically how much of the data, how, how random do we wanna grab this data from? So. Do we want to just take all of this data in order and just take the first, you know, 70% of our rows and use that? Or do we want to, to uh, mix it up a little bit? And that's actually important for this case. Um, you know, this is uh, just like individual data points. So how big an African giant pouched rat <laughs> is, well, I chose a really interesting one, um, in terms of body and brain doesn't necessarily like correlate with one of the others um, like strongly. And so it doesn't really matter what we're doing here, at least right now. Okay, and then what we're gonna actually do is just get our linear regression algorithm. And we're going to fit our X train and Y train data to that, to that model. And so again, this, you can imagine this line is literally you taking the practice exams, seeing how well you do, doing, taking it again, like practicing, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Awesome. Um, how do you install the Jupyter? Thank you, uh, Christopher. Yep. Um, so the easiest way that I found, there's those docs, but the easiest way that I found again is just this Python extension. And then when you open up a Jupyter notebook file, it, it typically opens it up for you. Okay. So now we've actually basically trained our model. That's that's what this is doing. So the nice thing about uh, using Python, and this is something Adrian mentioned yesterday as well, why we like to use Python um, is because there's just a ton of libraries and packages and, and modules that you can import that make doing this type of thing really easy and seamless. And so um, we don't have to create a linear regression model. That's a whole other topic of like, you know, improving models and things like that. Um, but we can actually just use ones that are like industry validated. Okay. Let's actually plot how well we did here. Okay, so we're going to um, basically do the same thing again. So uh, let's grab our, our scatter plot. Uh, we want our X to be body again, and we want our Y to be brain again, just like before, uh, and we want them to be log. We want to keep them scaled because we scaled our data on for a reason. So I'm just going to, I'm going to change this other way this time so that you can see it's kind of the same. 
Whether you have spaces between the commas or not, doesn't matter. Um, and then we're, what we're going to, in addition to that, so that's just going to give us that same, the same one here, right? Nothing different. The only difference is I split log X and log Y from log log, just to show you that you could do it in either way. In addition to that, what we're going to do is we're going to plot um, basically the line that shows for every x value what the what the prediction from your linear regression model was. Okay, so let's remember we do still need to um, uh, scale here. So for the x value, what is the resulting y value? And we're going to make this line red so that it's easy to see. So again, normally what you might do is like if we didn't, if we hadn't scaled our data, just so that we can see what this looks like a little bit easier and then we can understand it um, with the scale. So if you hadn't scaled your data, it would have looked like the plot would have looked like this. So we would be basically plotting for every X, put a dot for the prediction of y. Okay. And what we're trying to see here is how much does that line match our actual data? So looking at this data, is the is that line, is that prediction going to be like this? <laughs> or is it going to be right across it? Or is it going to be down here? Like what does that line look like? Because this will be a line for every single x value, right? Okay. So we're going to scale those and run it. And don't forget the C and predict. Awesome. All right, I think we're done. <laughs> um, not really. Uh, but this is, it looks, it looks pretty fit. Like it looks like it, it, it accurate, is pretty accurate. Um, so that's exciting. Uh, just like before, so earlier, I wanted to take this kind of like textual based data and look at it in a graph form because looking at it in this text form is hard for my brain to actually visualize what's happening. Here we're kind of having the opposite problem. I'm looking at this and I'm like, yeah, that looks good. Uh, that's not good enough when you're doing like, you know, legit research. Um, so one thing that we can do, as I mentioned when we were importing libraries, is actually score how well this model is doing. Um, so we can take our Y test, which is, if you remember, that's basically when we did this splitting, Y test is the teacher's answer key, right? So Y test is the true Y value. And we can compare that to when we ran our, basically when we used our linear regression model to predict the X test. So this is your answers to the test, the linear regression models predictions, and this is the true answer. All right. I don't know. Yes, this will be available somewhere on YouTube. And um, Megan or Christopher can drop the link in the chat for y'all. Um, yeah, I hope everything is OK. Uh, MRIs can be interesting. <laughs> I did a study once in college uh, where I got to do an fMRI machine and then I got to actually run it. It was kind of crazy. Um, pretty interesting. So um, I don't know. I'm going to take predictions. What do you all think? How accurate? I mean, this looks this looks pretty good to me. But percentage wise, how accurate do people think it is? Plop, plop something in the chat. What do you think? Super accurate? 20%? 80%? 100%? Ninety percent, yeah. And if you're if you're running this in the in the oh, as we're doing it, don't don't cheat. Seventy five percent, okay, cool. Let's try it out. Eighty, hundred percent. Ooh, hundred percent. I feel like we should just like call the I don't know overlords of science and say, hey, we won. <laughs> Ninety eight point four. Ooh, 87.5, so 87%, which is actually pretty darn good. Um, 
that's a that's a pretty good uh, uh, score right there. Uh, before we move on, though, why don't we try playing around with this a little bit? So we, we were like splitting our data 70, 30 and having a random state of zero. Um, why don't we try rerunning this stuff? So like I mentioned, one of the nice things about Jupyter Notebooks is that you can rerun cells. So we can take, you know, I mean, X and Y isn't really going to change, but that's fine. We can take, we can re-split our data and recreate a new linear regression and refit them. Uh, so then that way we're not doing like any overfitting here. You want to be careful of that. Um, let's go ahead and change our random state to 42 and just see if that changes anything. So remember, um, uh, and actually I'll probably leave this one here. What we'll do, actually what we'll do is, um, let's just, uh, before we change anything, um, this is with um, random state is zero and um, split is uh, 70, 30. Then that way we just have that um, and then we can redo it again later. Okay. So we're going to change our random state to 42. Let's rerun this cell. And then again, now we can, um, oops, I scrolled up too far. Um, now we can see that this cell is uh, number 15. And so we can verify that this was run before that cell was rerun. So this data is still from the earlier um, version. And um, I kind of want to replot also. So let's just, let's just kind of do this over again. Um, Replot this. I mean, it looks pretty much exactly the same. It may not matter. I mean, we, we have like a pretty small test set, so changing that may not matter too much. Let's see. Ooh, 84.9. So it is actually lower. Um, 87, 84. So changing that random state does change it. That's interesting. Um, I don't know. What if we try to change the split? What if we had like uh, the opposite? <laughs> Any predictions of what will happen? Um, here, let's go ahead and put this back to zero. Any predictions of what would happen if we changed our test size to 70%? Do we think that our score will go up or our score will go down? looks kind of the same. You can tell like the line got a little bit moved there. Precision should decrease with the less training data. That would be my assumption too. Let's check. Whoa, <laughs> it increased. <laughs> I actually did not expect that. I thought that that would decrease. Yeah, that's true. It does depend on the numbers it pulls, like which, which, um, but if the random state is zero, it should be like, if that random state is the same, it should be pulling the same one. So I actually did not expect that to, to happen. Um, that's interesting. What if we do the opposite? What if we not just 0.7, but like, let's do like that. So let's rerun this. Let's grab this. Okay, and then let's take a look at this. And this time I did a um, 90 10. Ah, go away. Interesting. Yeah, I think this is overfitted. I think we're just kind of like messing things up here. But um, the point of this, like, we are just kind of like playing with numbers right now. I'm not being super, um, you know, uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for is like, uh, deliberate. That's what I'm looking for. I'm not being very deliberate in what I'm doing here. I'm just kind of, you know, playing around with stuff. What we would actually do in this situation is given this first, um, this first result here, uh, we might actually want to chat with the, SMEs, subject matter experts in biological sciences, and ask them a little bit more about, you know, um, I don't know, just like a little bit more about like, is this is this scaled data look 
you know, about accurate. Um, what does that accuracy look like? Um, do we have more data that we want to include, that we want to test, et cetera, et cetera? The important thing to notice here, though, is just basically that um, your random state and your split can and will affect how accurate your model is. Um, and so that's just something that you have to make sure that you're taking into account. And there are some, uh, let me grab this. There are some tools to help with this. Um, let me grab the uh, docs and show you all those tools. Um, and OBS, go back to browser. Cool. Uh, so there are these these tools. Um, AutoML is one that Azure offers. Well, AutoML is is not Microsoft specific or Azure specific, but we have a feature as part of Azure machine learning called AutoML. And basically it can help you find the right parameters um, for your machine learning models and your and the right like featureizations um, to get the most accurate model. So here is, for example, regression with automated machine learning. And it basically takes in your data set, um, con different constraints that you might have, and then optimization metrics. And it runs it through like a bunch of them and then finds the best uh, model and the best kind of parameters there for you. So yeah, if you wanna learn more about that, you should definitely check that out here. And, um, just take a look. There's like the getting started with machine learning experiment with the Python SDK. Um, this is where you're actually going to be using Azure machine learning, um, not just doing like calling scikit, scikit's learn, scikit learns, couldn't figure out where to put the S there, um, uh, on your local machine, but actually like running it in the cloud and all of that. Um, so this is running it in the workspace. This is kind of getting that all set up for you in here. Um, and then there's some instructions on training your model. And uh, this, the reason why you'll want to actually create an Azure machine learning resource for this one is so that you can use AutoML. Um, so then it's fairly simple. Uh, you can see that we're still using scikit-learn to do our train test split. And we're still using scikit-learn to, to um, create our model. So this one's using a ridge linear model. Uh, it's fitting it here, doing the predictions, um, putting all of the stuff in the output here. Um, and then uh, over here is where we would get the best model. So for every single time that it ran, it's going to create, um, we're, 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 it, we're going to add that to the outputs file. And then we're basically going to grab uh, the best run. So if you'd like, um, yes. Uh, Hyperparameter tuning for those who haven't seen it before. But yeah, basically um, same kind of thing that we're doing here. So here's a, this towards data science one I've found useful. In the past, I don't know if it's actually this one that I was thinking of, but um, this one does look fairly useful. I can pop that in there. Awesome. Okay. So let me grab this again. Where are we? All right, so now we've got um, one set. So actually, let me rerun just with our originals. Um, just, I don't know why, just because. Let's rerun this. And um, we still have that data up here. We don't need to, to rerun that. So that's our 87.5 score here. All right, um, so the next thing 
that we want to explore um, is taking a look at, or rather, um, one thing that I did want to mention is looking at the data using our um, predictions without, sorry, let me get my brain straight. Um, so we want to take a look at our data, like our original data, not our scaled data, and then take a look at how our model did a across that. Okay, so we'll take a look at that real quick. So again, we're just gonna get the body and the brain. Awesome. And then we're gonna create an X-ray. Again, we just wanna grab, um, basically this is the same as doing that shaping. We're just gonna like make sure that we've got one a 1D array that's all of the values of X. And then we want to plot uh, x array with the exponent of the, um, because remember we used the, we trained the model on our scaled data. So basically we're kind of like undoing that now so that we can see what the model looks like uh, unscaled. Does that make sense? So we're gonna take this np.log x-array. So instead of passing in x-array to the prediction algorithm, we're going to pass in the log of it. And then let me make sure I'm correct on my, um, and again, we need to make sure it's in the correct shape for doing the um, one, two, three. Oh, goodness gracious. Do I have all of the right? <laughs> Okay, there we go. And um, again, we want it to be red. So let's take a look at the difference between what we did here. Here we just grabbed uh, predict x test, or sorry, we can look at this one, predict um, x, right? And then we grab the exponent of that. And here we're basically grabbing the log of x array, which is the reshaped data um, and predicting that and then grabbing the exponent of that. So let's take a look at what, oops, I have a, an apostrophe at the end. No, what did I did wrong? Uh, thank you, that's what I did wrong. Okay, again, I, I kind of feel like our scaled graphs kind of give us a better indication of how fit they are, um, but this will, will kind of give you that line of what that looks like. One thing that was mentioned um, on, let's see session focus on domains like AI ops, IOT. Yeah, please, if you have ideas for future sessions, please let us know. Um, in fact, actually, I'm going to do a, a shameless plug for a second. It's not really a shameless plug, but um, please, if you have not, oh, that's still my starting screen. No, I don't mean starting screen. Um, if you have a chance, either now or at the end, if you're going to be able to stay to the end, uh, if you could please fill out a survey for us. Uh, the purposes of this survey, it's anonymous, don't worry, but the purposes of this survey is um, to make sure that if there is information that you want or future streams or videos or when we go back in person for reactors, if there's other kinds of things that you want to see, um, please let us know. So if you can't stay till the end, uh, fill this out. Uh, Megan will plop that link and event code in the description or in the comments. Um, and if you're watching this on YouTube, please also fill out the survey. We'd really appreciate it. I do not want to spend two hours <laughs> talking about things nobody cares about. So I would rather talk about things you do care about. Please fill out the survey so then that way we can talk about things you care about. Cool. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention was um, one thing that, uh, where am I? There we are. One thing that no, that's the wrong browser. Where is my browser window? That's the browser. One thing that Adrian mentioned yesterday in our Twitter stream and that we were uh, kind of talking about is that, sorry. Yes, I lost my train of thought completely. Uh, one thing that we were talking about and that we talked about a little bit at the beginning today was that uh, what a lot of, especially this kind of like biological sciences where where we've got this interesting 
kind of confusion and, and, and messy data and things that we don't even fully understand, like what how much of the brain is used for what and all of that. I mean, I know we understand some of that, but not all of it. Um, one thing that he mentioned was that, gosh, I'm rambling. Maybe if I put my face on, it'll help. One thing that he mentioned was that you have to be comfortable with the unknown and with the messy, okay? So when you're exploring this data, uh, you don't actually know. So I'll give you a concrete example. He does proteomics research. I am not a bioinformatics scientist, so I don't fully understand everything he does. But from what I understand, they'll take a sample from, let's say, a human, and they will they have databases and databases full of other samples of individual proteins and their masses, like their mass signature, like we talked about at the beginning of the stream. And so what they'll basically do is if they're looking for someone, they're looking for something in someone's sample. Okay, so if they're looking for an anomaly, they'll take that sample and they'll look, they'll grab all of the other known samples of mass signatures on proteins. They'll overlay that basically on the human sample. And they'll basically say, okay, we can ignore all of this. What's left? What's left is this little mass signature that is unaccounted for. That might be the thing, the anomaly that we're looking for. And so an example of this, um, and again, I am not a scientist. Do not take this as like 100% truth, but this is the, the kind of like layman's terms, at 100 level understanding of what's going on. An example of this is if we have an, a person who has contracted an infectious disease and then they survived, we want to, and we don't have kind of that cure or that therapeutic or anything to help those who aren't. The benefit of this is we can take a sample from that person who did survive and we can pull out everything we do know and the thing that's left might be the thing that helped them survive. And that is something that we would continue to research and use as the base for our therapeutic and then try to give that to a person um, who contracts the disease to see if it'll help them survive. So that's kind of the basics of the proteomic research and, and what people are doing. It's not as clean as that. It's not like you you literally say, you know, put two things next to each other and find all of the things that are missing like we did when we were kids in those picture books. Um, it, it, it's messier than that. It's messier than that because we don't know everything about our world. Um, we don't know everything about the human body, which means that there might be things um, that you're seeing a mass for that has nothing to do with the infectious disease and just happens to be there because it's something else. Uh, it might also mean that the um, sample, you know, was contaminated in some way, um, some tiny, tiny way, maybe just like, uh, um, you know, when they were collecting it or, uh, you know, sometimes with 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 these um with this research, we're, you know, collecting things from all around the world. We're storing them in, you know, Antarctica to, to, to preserve the, the quality of it. Um, how old is the, is the sample? Where was it collected? How was it transported? Um, how does things like heat or humidity or movement affect the sample? I don't actually know these answers, but that's why the data isn't always clean. And then once the sample is run through like a mass spectrometer, the mass spectrometer is not perfect. I mean, we're taking this physical sample and we're trying to digitize it, it's never going to be perfect. Um, even just like taking my physical face and digitizing it to you on this stream is not perfect. So imagine trying to do that in that kind of way. Again, our instruments are like the humans that do the collection and the storage, the instruments that do the analysis, all are not perfect. And then we get to this point of um, trying to determine things, which is also not perfect. Um, because as we know, code is not perfect. <laughs> uh, that I'm not trying to scare you in terms of like, you know, therapeutics and things like that. What I'm trying to say is that that's why these problems are so hard. And that's why it's so critical and important that we um, are, are understanding of the data that we're analyzing and what the impact is and, and where that data came from and why and how. Um, it's important that if you are a machine learning expert or a data scientist or a coder who's working on this type of thing, that you are communicating with subject matter experts, that you are communicating with understanding, again, where, how, why, what, all of that in terms of the collection of the data, 
before you even start analyzing it. And that's why those initial few moments of graphing it and just looking at the, you know, min, medium, and max, and and just kind of understanding the data and getting an, a sense of the data as we know it inside of like Visual Studio Code, that part is so incredibly critical. Because if you make any wrong assumptions there, everything you do from then on is just wrong, right? And so we want to try to minimize all the, the wrong assumptions there. And then again, recognizing that all of the machine learning models like like we mentioned earlier, if it's if it's a hundred percent, you're probably wrong. <laughs> um, it, they're they're never really going to be a hundred percent, right? Um, never with a grain of salt. Who knows? But uh, that's because humans are writing these models. That's because you know we don't have truth for for data, etc. Um, so that's kind of my 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 little rant on why this kind of thing is really important. And uh, there's there is this great uh, kind of quote from. Um, from statistician George Box on all models are wrong. And it, it's just kind of, you know, a, a good read to go through. Um, but the, the point of all of this is that, um, you know, this is a hard problem, not the one on how heavy is an elephant's head or brain uh, necessarily, but the, the problem of trying to predict things or know a truth based on data that isn't that truth, right? Being able to look at the size of a mammal and say, like, take the weight of a mammal and say, based on your weight, I'm confident that your brain size is this and therefore you likely are able to do this, right? Or you likely have this level of intelligence. Um, that is a hard problem to solve. And that's why data science and machine learning are just such interesting fields, especially when you pair them with other industries like biological sciences. Um, yeah, so interesting stuff. All right, we're gonna switch gears. Um, it's been just over an hour. If anyone wants to like, you know, stretch your legs, get a glass of water, Feel free. For a longer stream, sometimes we like to have little pauses. Um, in fact, if you are going to do that, maybe also consider filling out the survey. <laughs> I'd really like to make another cup of coffee, but it takes forever. I've got this like Mr. Coffee Cafe Barista thing. Because if I just have like plain coffee, I tend to get headaches and stomach aches. Um, have fun at your genetics lab. I'm kind of jealous. I want to know what you're learning. <laughs> See you all. See you later. Yay. Thank you for filling out the survey. I appreciate it. Um, yeah. Drop in the comments what kind of coffee or tea or morning drink of choice do you all like? I do like a, a simple latte. Ooh, PCR. What is PCR? PCR. You said it was a genetics lab. PCR genetics. Polymerase chain reaction, a method widely used in molecular biology to rapidly, rapidly make millions to billions of copies of a specific DNA sample allowing scientists to take a very small sample of DNA and amplify it large enough to study in detail. Awesome. Very cool. Green tea. Ooh. Aeropress. Black coffee. Nice. Yeah, I don't know why. Like, every time I have black coffee, and I've tried all of the, like, good from home and going to, to fills and like all of those things it, like regardless of where I go black coffee even if I add cream or just have it black like I always tend to get like this weird stomach ache um but if I have an Americano I don't so I don't know if it's just like the difference in um hello Brazil how are you I don't know if it's the difference in the way that the coffee is made or or what but um that is something that I've noticed so I invested in this it's, it's like 130 dollars fairly expensive but it it allows me to make a quick latte where i just have to kind of push a button um but it takes time to to warm up and it's really loud so it's not worth the time now true i also just like yeah 
I don't know why Americanos. I mean, it's essentially just two espresso shots and some hot water. I don't know why that one doesn't give me that weird stomach ache, but it like just a drip coffee does. <laughs> Speaking of empty stomach, I definitely should have eaten more, but oh well, or something this morning. I was too excited to jump on the stream and try to make sure that I got all this working. So uh, like all my OBS, I still haven't had time to like fully set up my machine. <laughs> all right. We'll go ahead and jump back back over. So what we're going to do next, um, if you did clone the the repo and, and are following along, we did start to explore some links data in there and start to talk a little bit about um, about k-means. And I'll show you for a second just kind of like what that is, but that's more of a go ahead and try things on your own. Um, what I So I, I'll, I'll show you that briefly for the next like maybe five, 10 minutes. And then what we're going to do is we're going to jump into the iris data set. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that. And uh, we're going to try doing a k-means um, clustering on that data set uh, and a k nearest neighbors clus uh, classification on that data set to see um, a couple of different machine learning models. So we've done the, the linear um, with the uh, with the mammals data and then with the iris data we're going to do some k k nearest neighbors and k mean stuff. Awesome. Okay, so let's show you VS Code again. And like I said, I'm going to quickly go over this links data is basically for each year, how many links were found. That's that's all the data is. Again, we don't have like a ton of data sets or uh, data points, 115. Uh, that's all it is, though. And I just wanted to use this data as an introduction to why linear regression isn't just the answer, basically. And um, then I want to take the iris data that we know more about, show you some strategies, and then after the stream, I invite you to revisit this links data and um, try different machine learning models on it to see what you can learn. Okay? So again, we just need to read this links data in. It's in the data folder under links.csv. And let's go ahead and plot it. Um, I don't need to print out print it out in a in a data frame. I know what it looks like. Um, oops, here, and we want our y to be the number of links. Make sure those are categorized. Here in links, awesome. So. Why is this data already like chemistry coffee is very acidic? Yeah. Um, why is this data, like how would we know just looking at the plot of this data that linear regression is probably not a good model for this? Any ideas? What about this plot makes linear regression probably not a great model? No ideas? It's not a line. Yes. Perios, peri, periodicity. Peri, I, oh my gosh. <laughs> no clear trend. Yeah, exactly. Um, periodic. There we go. I like that word better. <laughs> um, yes. It, basically, uh, there's just, there's no line, right? Linear regression line. We're, we're, we're not, we're not saying a line here. Um, but let's actually just like look at what would happen um, if, if we were so I'm going to copy and paste code here and I'll just like quickly show you because we're not going to dive deep into this. This will be your quote unquote homework or opportunity to to try out on your own. But let's actually try running this through a linear regression model. Um, so we'll take X as the as the year and Y is the number of links. We'll split it. We're still just going to do 30 uh, percent random state of zero. Get our linear regression model, fit it and plot it with a line that goes through it. And there's our line. Looking at that line, any predictions on our score? I mean, we know it's bad. 0 0.04. It's even worse than that. It's negative 0 0.01. 
Yeah, this is really bad. What does negative mean? I mean, negative literally means that if you were to just take the average number and just have a straight line across, you would be more accurate than this model. Um, and that's why linear regression, maybe not so much. It's not always the answer. Um, other types of models include things like classification models. Uh, and that's when we're going to jump into some of the, the K nearest neighbor stuff. So um, I don't want to go through it with this stuff. I want you to try that on your own. And if you're looking at the GitHub repo, it's not there. Um, but uh, I because this is meant to be something that you just kind of explore on your own. Um, so let's take a look at the iris data. OK, so the iris data, I wanted to quickly show you what that was. Um, Basically, um, it's a data set that's got um, like 150 records across the different like lengths of the um, like inner part of the flower as well as the petal of the flower compared with the species. OK, and this is one of those data sets from Scikit-Learn. So if you, uh, I thought I had it open, but maybe I didn't. Um, Scikit-Learn iris. Um, so you've got the uh, iris data set here. And there's a bunch of existing code on it. And you can kind of check that out. And there's more information here. So um, I'll plop these links over in the chat as well. Doo -doo -doo. There you go. OK. Um, so let's start exploring this data using some of the other models that we have have started to hear about. So because we've already got scikit-learn module installed, the, the iris module um, imported, we can bring this in by just running load iris. This is why, again, Python is useful because we've got all of these libraries and packages that already have things like scikit-learn already has all of these data sets that we can just use. Um, so we're going to grab in the iris data and we want to predict the iris target. Um, and if we take a look at, where is the, here we go. Um, so basically what we're going to do is, sorry, I got distracted, um, split that. So the target, I think the target is species. And then let's just go ahead and take a look at the data frame here. So we've, we're going to create a data frame on the iris data. And the data is going to be iris's data. And the um, columns are going to be the feature names. And then we'll take a look at that. What does that look like? What is this? What are you? So the data are these lengths. We can take a look at um, the describe of this iris df not. So 150. Not a huge difference in, in lengths, which makes sense. These are all flowers. Um, so what we're going to do first is k means clustering which is an example of unsupervised machine learning. We're not going to go into a, a whole bunch of detail on all of the different models. Um, that's kind of beyond the scope of what we're doing today. We're just going to start to explore it. Uh, but I wanted to kind of give those words out there so then that way you can look them up and, and find more information about it. So rather than training the model, k-means algorithms basically looks at all the data and determines which category to assign a particular observation. So if, if you know, this is a particular observation. And basically what it's going to do is it's going to assign that to a particular category. OK, so we will provide an algorithm with the number of categories that we want to assign the um, observations into. OK. 
Um, so we're going to grab K means. And we're going to say, I only want three clusters. And random state is going to be zero. And we're going to fit. So notice that the difference here, fit, when we did it with linear regression, required the X train and Y train. Here, fit only requires the X data. And that's because, again, this is an unsupervised machine learning model. So all it's doing is taking in, it's basically looking at, so here, let me explain this better. Totally making this up and I should have had a better explanation prepared. But basically, let's say that you were just looking at, um, you know, here, all of my colored pencils. <laughs> OK, and there's just like a bunch of colored pencils here. They're all different colors. Um, and I said to this machine learning model or you, if you were my machine learning model, I want you to split this into two categories. How, how, how would you do that? Basically, the model will start to look at the different features and the different, um, what was the word that we just used? Words are hard to remember. Um, category, sorry, observations. Um, I do this thing where when I can't remember words, I can remember the shape of the first letter. And so I was thinking it was a C, but it was an O, observations. Uh, we can look at the observations of these. So the observations could be something like, like color tone. Um, if some of these were like open though, so for example, uh, you can like open it. I'm gonna do like the whole YouTube, I'm a, I'm a beauty guru and you can kind of see it. I don't know if this is working. Kind of, yes. So see how you can kind of like open it? Maybe, no, hello, hi, yeah, no, okay, whatever, it's fine. Um, it's like a mechanical pencil, right? Yeah, there you go. So you can kind of open it. Um, maybe that's an observation, right? So maybe some of them are open, some of them are not, and maybe that's a better way to classify things. Um, basically, thank you for my collection. <laughs> um, uh, I use these to color into my Harry Potter book. Yeah, it's quite fun. I'm such an artist. It's amazing. Anyways, total tangent. Um, what it's doing is taking a bunch of observations and 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 clustering them, basically categorizing them, putting putting them into clusters. So what we're saying is, I want you to take all of this data, this 150 rows, and you figure out machine learning algorithm. You figure it out which category should these fall into. I want three categories. Okay. So that's what basically we're doing here. So we're going to fit um, the model. And then we're going to grab the predictions, OK? Predict x. So then we fit it. And then basically, we're just saying, OK, now tell me what category this belongs into. And then we can take a look at the accuracy. This is just another way of looking at accuracy. And um, yeah, let's take a look at that. What did I do wrong? Accuracy, scory, scory. What did I do wrong? Metrics.accuracy, did I spell that wrong? Oh, just kidding. Oh my gosh, this pop-up annoys me. There we go. So it's like 9% accurate. Not not super great. Um, we can try doing some different things like changing the random state again. Oh, that's, that's a lot more accurate. Um, what if we just change it to like one? Whoa, so changing it at all. Am I overfitting again? OK, there we go. <laughs> so uh, even just having a random state of 1, it looks like anything more than 0 is more accurate. Interesting. Let's leave it at 42. Why not? Cool. Um, thank you. 
Okay. Um, why do we think that there is a big difference when we have a random state of zero versus a random state of anything other than zero, basically? Does anyone have an idea? Random state changes the centroid. How does it know which class to label one, two, or three? Just ask your SUS4 account for that. Um, so that is what the uh, the fitting does. Is it's it doesn't know that's what it's basically doing is figuring out which which class to label it. Yeah. So basically. If we are choosing something random, so when we're looking at, let's see, was there a good, um, yeah, Christopher, that is a good kind of, oh, OBS. I have like dark mode enabled on too many things and so it's hard to figure out which window I'm trying to look at. Um, basically, if we're if we're looking at the, the um, like which, where is the center of our, of our, uh, categories to to kind of split this data on right so if we have random um if we if we move that around then we're more likely to be able to know where we want to split things if that kind of makes sense again we're not going to go into crazy amounts of detail about k-means but that is a good reference for you and then i promised because we're getting close to it but i promised that we would also take a look at um k nearest neighbor oh sorry uh before we do that, I almost forgot. Um, one thing that we can do is, oh no, yeah, okay, sorry, I scrolled and then I got confused. Before we end, we're gonna do K nearest neighbors. And K nearest neighbors might be better than doing K means because if we look at K nearest neighbors, um, let's grab that Wikipedia article too. Do, do, do. And we do this. Um, K nearest neighbors, and this is kind of like the graph that was more of an aha moment for me. Basically what it's doing is it's, it's taking your sample. So that's that green dot. And it's deciding, in this, in this case, it's gonna decide between two different categories. Is it a red triangle or is it a blue square? And so if you want to take your K nearest neighbors, so it's gonna look at the nearest neighbors to that. And it's going to say, if our K nearest neighbors um, was, if we're doing it on, uh, uh, if our parameter for um, the number of neighbors that we want to compare against is three, then it's going to take a look at only the three closest neighbors in the data set. And it's going to make a prediction on whether it's a red triangle or a green square based on that. So basically it would say, you know what? This is totally a red triangle or it's likely a red triangle because that's what else is around here. And what do we mean by like around here? This is kind of a very abstract concept, but um, basically what the machine learning model is doing is it's looking at all of the different columns, all of the different features, all of the different observations, and it's uh, uh, finding similarities and differences between them. Again, this is way out of scope of what we're talking about, but, but you can kind of imagine that. So if we were to take our iris data and basically look at it right in this kind of way where we we plot like the sepal width and and length for example this is just looking at those two um columns but we also have the petal width and length and also am i pronouncing is it sepal or is it sepal i'm not sure um so you're going to kind of take a look at this then you can see that you know red ones are near to each other, orange ones are near to each other, and then you've got this like gray ones as well. So um, I'm not exactly sure exactly what's happening here, but but you can start to see these clusters. Uh, we can actually see what's happening here if we look at it in, in uh, three dimension or, or in PCA, which we are going to look at briefly. Again, we're not going to go into details of it, but we're going to look at it with this um, data set. You can see where uh, um, gray and orange are separated. They're separated um, on this other dimension here. So when we're looking at it in this direct dimension in only 2D, we can't really see that differentiation. But when we look at it here, we can. Um, basically, what it's doing is it's looking at all of your columns and all of your um, the, your features, and it's 
grouping them in these ways and then it's using that information to determine who are your neighbors and then if your neighbors are certain things then you are likely that thing um, and the number of neighbors that you're looking at is really important in this um, because if you look at only three nearest neighbors you're going to get this red triangle and if you look at five nearest neighbors you're likely going to be a blue square um, and so that's why again thinking about uh, the size of our our like comparisons, right? So the size of the number of neighbors that we're looking at, this would probably be a question that I would ask of the subject matter expert in flowers. I would say like, you know, how much variance is there or, you know, at what point, um, like are there, is there a lot of data points that are within this, the same area uh, that would allow us to, to grow it a little bit more to get a more accurate description or would that be um, make it less accurate because we're taking into account too much um, variance okay so let's bring this back up and let's start doing k nearest neighbors so this time we are again going to split our training data and our testing data we're going to do a random state of zero to start. And we're going to create a K nearest neighbors um, like object, basically be able to be able to run the model. Uh, and we're going to say that we want five neighbors. We're going to fit. We're going to predict. And we're going to score. All right, we're gonna do random state of zero. Remember random state of zero earlier caused this to be like very inaccurate versus when we did anything else. And K nearest neighbors um, is, a, is a classification algorithm. Uh, so it is, con comparing observation um so this is a supervised algorithm remember when we did k-means it was unsupervised which means we didn't have to uh uh we didn't give it a why we didn't give it the answer because it was just kind of looking at all of the colored pencils right and trying to decide in this case we know what the answer is and we're basically saying it is one of these three things i know what the one of those three things is um so we do want to fit it against the answer Okay, so let's go ahead and run this. 97% accurate. Um, that's that's pretty darn good. Uh, I have a question though. What happens if we change this to like three? Do we think the accuracy will change a lot? Not so much. Not so much. Doesn't look like it changes much at all. I think our data set's pretty small too, though. So what about changing our um, random state? Wow. <laughs> Again, our data set's not very large. 150 is not super big. I wouldn't trust 100% here. Um, but, you know, there you go. All right. Again, part of the issue with with like machine learning models in general is being able to um, make sure that we are properly training without overfitting and determining what is the best um, like nearest neighbors that we want to use to to increase our score and that kind of thing. Uh, so one way that we can do this is by using uh, cross validation. And this is like, again, a bit beyond scope. Where did my cross-validation come from? Here it is. Um, but let me share this with you all. Grab that URL. So we're not gonna go into a crazy amounts of detail here, but um, we want to avoid overfitting, which is 
what was happening when we changed our random state because it was like, oh yeah, totally. I mean, even 97%, like that's really high. Um, so it's likely overfitting. And basically that just means that we are giving too much of the answer away. So if you think back to our um, example of comparing a pretest and a and a an actual exam, um, it's like they didn't change the questions too much. That's kind of how I like to think about it. So one thing that you can do is use cross-validation um, to, to help with this, okay? So basically it would change a bunch of the parameters um, and, and test it out in a way that doesn't overfit the actual model to determine what are the best parameters to use. And then when you actually And we're back. <laughs> OBS just likes to do these things where, you know, just randomly stops. Why not? I mean, totally fine. We don't need to do things. Um, it looks like my screen is like super not great. Let me try. I'm going to refresh my window. OK, I think we're back. I think we're good. I see you. Are you scrolling? Yay. OK. Awesome. Where were we? Um, yes, so cross-validation. So basically, uh, that's why Adrian was saying yesterday that he likes to use Python, because that allows him to use these uh, modules and these libraries and packages that are like already made by people who spend way more time on this than I do, um, or than even he does on the, the actual like machine learning parts. Um, so we can just use this cross-validation method. And what we can do is get, so this is basically basically going to get all of the scores of all of the times that it ran with all of the different parameters. And we can get the average of that. And we can see that the average of the scores is still pretty high. So this is um, doing a tenfold cross-validation. So basically um, trying out, trying it out that many times. All right, couple more things and then we'll be done. Um, one thing is, and I'm just gonna kind of like show these. Uh, these are in the GitHub repo. Um, this is the code that you could use to basically take all of your cross validations, get the, the basically best one and determine um, what your parameters should be to, to yield the highest um, accuracy. So what we're going to do is we're going to basically just create uh, the nearest neighbor's range from 1 to 26. We're going to create a dictionary. We're going to go through that whole range. We're going to run k nearest neighbor's classifier on 1 and then on 2 and then on 3 and then on 4 and then on 5, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we're going to run cross-validation um, on your data. Save all of that information inside of that dictionary. So for the number of nearest neighbors, uh, what is the score? And then after we've done that for one through 26 neighbors, we're going to grab the max. So what was the highest score? And we're gonna print that out. All right. We saw earlier, where were we? Here, that when we were changing it between like, you know, one and two, it didn't really do anything. Um, but why don't we change it to like 15? Hmm, that still doesn't seem to be doing much. Oh, but we weren't using the cross-validation score there, so it wasn't hyper It wasn't um, uh, changing those parameters, those other parameters. So there's other parameters uh, beyond what we're saying here. So like k-nearest neighbors, that's like one parameter, but uh, there are other parameters, and you can look at the individual machine learning models to see what those are. Um, again, that's part of the, the, the benefit of not needing to run these um, 
completely on your own is, or that's another benefit of using these packages and these existing models is that you can you can use those. So it looks like Kanier's Neighbors of 13 is actually the best, um, yields the, the most accurate score, 98%. And we showed that PCA graph over in uh, the browser, but I wanted to also show it to you here because you can actually run that in VS Code. Um, so principal component analysis, PCA. Again, we're not gonna go into details about that here, um, but we're gonna try to split our data across three components. Uh, we're gonna basically fit and transform our iris data. Um, and then, and um, so we're gonna split our and then we're gonna split it across three, okay? And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna actually graph all of that. So we're going to take a um, plot and it's going to um, be a 3D and we're just gonna set some things here. So this is like our, our the size of everything. And we're gonna do a scatter and it's gonna be on um, X reduced, which is our PCA um, after running it through PCA. And we can run this. And there's that pretty 3D graph. So we can see those differences in those three categories and it colors it for us, right? So when it runs it through PCA, that's what's doing the coloring. And then the plotting is just kind of graphing it out and we can see those. All right, and that's basically what we have for today. Um, as a few reminders, let me share my browser again. You can find our GitHub repo at github.com slash Microsoft slash reactors. And in this repository, we have a folder called online. Let me zoom in a little bit here. And the genomic stuff, I, I guess it's not technically genomics. I should rename that to biosciences. Um, but all of the, the work that we did today is here. Um, if you have not already, please, please head over to our survey and fill it out for us. Um, the survey information, I will drop back in the chat again. Um, please fill out the survey. Uh, the event code I just popped in there, it's 7342. Whether you're watching this on Twitch or you're watching this on YouTube, please fill this out regardless. Uh, what we're trying to do is understand the content and whether or not it's something that you're interested in um, and like who you are. So then that way, when we do have new content, and again, this is anonymous, but then that way, when we do have new content, um, you know, we can see that folks who are in DevOps really want to have, you know, content on IoT that doesn't make sense, but, um, and we can, uh, we can make sure that we market it in that way. So that, the, that way, if it is something that's interesting to you, you'll will hopefully know, right? Um, all we're trying to do is get you free, free stuff, uh, get you the link, uh, the link to the survey. Let me grab it for you. I'll plop it, plop it in the chat again. So please, please, please fill out the survey and let us know. Um, yes, uh, there are still bioinformatics and genomics tools. I'm not using them here. The reason I'm not using them here is because I'm not actually demonstrating like like the, the true genomics and bioinformatics natures of like the, the researchers who are doing things, though I do want to do that in the future. Really, this was that 100 level kickboard, like you are either you know, learning about biology or chemistry or learning about data science and you want to know where that connection lies between the two um, and how you would start to get started. So this is that very first level, like what is the data? How would you look at it? What are machine learning models and algorithms and how might those um, interact? All of the data that we explored today is here, except for that scikit-learn um, iris data, which you can just import uh, if you have the scikit-learn module imported. Awesome. So um, yeah, that's our stream for today. I really appreciate y'all uh, coming over and spending a couple hours with me today. If you missed any part of today's stream, make sure you check out our YouTube channel. Uh, we will be posting not only today's stream, but also um, all of the streams that we ever do on our YouTube channel. We usually post them on Friday afternoons. Uh, and if for some reason you missed out on the, the um, stream from Tuesday, you can also still watch it on Twitch. 
uh, the last 10 streams are always on Twitch. So if it's not on YouTube yet, because we post on Fridays, um, check out Twitch and you'll be able to see it there. Uh, we typically stream about three times a week. Um, you can join our meetup pages. So meetup.com slash Microsoft Reactor. Uh, you can check out our meetup pages and um, SDE in the survey is Software Developer Engineer. Uh, we should probably write that out. Um, Join our meetup pages. Uh, if you are in one of the locations where we have a physical location, like Redmond or Tel Aviv or London, um, join that specific one. If you aren't in a city that has a physical location, still join the one that's nearest to you uh, because we will be posting digital events within your t like time zone um, on those meetup pages as well. So whether you can attend in person or not, uh, that's where you can get all of the up-to-date information about any events, digital or otherwise. So please uh, feel free to, to join those. Um, I noticed that there were some folks in the chat who were speaking, I think you're speaking Portuguese, um, maybe. Uh, I speak Spanish, it looked very close to Spanish, but there were some words I didn't recognize. So maybe I just don't speak Spanish as well as I thought. Um, or you were speaking Portuguese. We do have some events that will be in, uh, in uh, other languages other than English as well. So we do um, uh, digital events, for example, in um, Chinese, and we're gonna be doing some in Portuguese as well. So join the meetup pages for your nearest city so then that way you can get all of the up-to-date information about any events physical or otherwise said the same thing twice that's fine um and then yes finally please make sure you fill out our survey the one about linear regression is still missing do i have a um so the linear regression one uh, do you mean the one that we did on Tuesday? That one should be right. Let me find it for you. It's not on Twitter yet. Um, sorry, it's not on YouTube yet. Oh, and I think what happened was that the title didn't, didn't, um, oh no, it did. Okay. Here is the one that I did on Tuesday. It is not on YouTube yet. Um, at least the one I did on Tuesday is not on YouTube yet, but the one that I did on, um, Thursday of last week. You're right. That one is not on YouTube yet either, which that's strange because I definitely know that we uploaded it. Um, but that one is here. Whoa. Oh, that's a clip. I don't want the clip. I wanted the actual video. Video. Here we go. Um, the one we did last Thursday is here. Awesome. Um, yeah, so make sure you join the Meetup page for all the up-to-date information. Uh, follow us on Twitch or you subscribe to us on YouTube and follow us on Twitter if you have any, um, if you just wanna kind of like casually get that info, the one from April 30th. Yeah, that's the one from Thursday. That should be the second one that I posted there. Um, another part of the series where we go into analyzing genomes, I didn't, I don't have that, scheduled yet but if that's of interest please fill out the survey and let us know and that is something that we can definitely do um oh i didn't know that you could uh make a highlight of those videos to preserve them on twitch indefinitely uh we are we we share that twitch channel with a lot of other folks at microsoft so um that's why we try to make sure that all of our videos end up on our youtube channel um for that more indefinite but yes Oh, there wasn't a part to enter any text. Okay, well, thank you for putting um, your comments here. Yes, if it, another way to give us feedback um, is to comment uh, on our YouTube channel or within these Twitch streams, so then that way we can write it down. And we do have, we're constantly kind of monitor monitoring these and taking into account what you guys are saying here. Um, so if you have questions, like if, if I'm going over something and a lot of people are having questions in the chat and we don't have time to cover that in the stream, we make note of that and then, I mean, we've got a lot and not a lot of people, but we do try to make sure that we then create videos around that, um, whether they're gonna be future streams or just a pre-recorded video for you um, to try to help that. We also take that feedback back to some of the development teams and let them know like, oh, this was confusing or can we add some more docs about that? So yes, all of your feedback is is definitely welcome. And actually, the reason that we don't have uh, um, 
a text entry on that survey is because we want to make sure it remains anonymous and we don't want someone to accidentally put in their name there and then it's no longer anonymous. So that survey is meant to, to 100% be anonymous, which is why we avoid the text entry. Awesome. And if you uh, haven't already, make sure that you register for Build this year. I don't know if you all have heard, but Build is going to be, uh, and actually this is totally worth shouting out. Um, Build is going to be online and, and completely free. Uh, so you can register for Build here, completely, completely free, um, all online. It's 48 hours from May 19th to May 20th. And when I say 48 hours, I mean 48 hours. Uh, there will be constant um, uh, uh, streams going on. And uh, we are making sure that it's not like Pacific time heavy in the sense of we have quality, really interesting information at all hours of the day for the entire 48 hours so that where whatever time zone makes most sense for you to attend, you should get quality um, uh, uh, sessions during that time. And as part of this, one thing that we're doing is running some student sessions. And I wanted to highlight that because uh, student sessions are meant for just any learner who is, um, maybe you're uh, still an undergraduate student, uh, maybe you're an upper high school student, or maybe you're an adult professional developer, but wants to kind of get that more intro level, what what the heck is going on kind of thing. Um, and we're going to have the genomics team at Microsoft giving a talk uh, during build as part of that those student sessions. Um, so if you are really interested in the genomic data um, uh, sets and things like that, I highly recommend registering for build and checking out the student sessions and finding that genomics teams session. Um, I'm really excited to have them uh, as a part of that. So make sure you you register. Awesome. I'm glad to have folks who are who are not like quote unquote, not coders, uh, but I identify more as like a biologist or a chemist, um, because I do think uh, you know, one of the things that I was talking about with Adrian yesterday during our Twitter stream was um, the importance of biologists or chemists understanding the code and the machine learning and the data science and the importance of data scientists and machine learning and coders understanding the biology and chemistry is not so that you have one person that understands all of it, but rather so then that way you can have everyone be able to communicate better. So if you're a biologist and you're working with coders or data scientists and you understand some of it even if you like aren't a, an expert in it you just understand some of it and you could maybe even play around with it on your own a little bit that will help you better communicate with the people who are spending their entire day on it and likewise i think it's really important for the people who are data scientists and coders to recognize that they need to listen and learn and understand whatever the subject matter is that they're exploring um, t in order to create solutions and 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 um, and learnings from anything that they're building. I think that's absolutely critical. And one of the reasons that I focus on trying to create this content that is for the non-coder, which everyone I think is a coder, um, having someone like creating this content for the non-coder, I personally believe that it's easier to teach a non-coder, I'm saying all these with air quotes because it is it is um, like very generalized, uh, a bit about the code than it is to teach a coder about the subject matter. Um, just because the subject matter tends to have a lot more like experience needed and nuanced things and just kind of this, this huge array. As you could see from here, like I'm more of the coder. I don't know all of the details about biology. And, and for me to fully understand all of that would be a lot more effort um, versus like if you wanted to try this out, you could, you know, clone our repo or, 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 or you know, like open it up and, and just start playing around. And if it if it fails, it fails. And that's OK, because that's part of coding and you just rerun it. Um, and there's docs and forums and these kind of streams. And there's just like a lot of people who kind of can give you little bits of information all around. Um, so we're trying really hard to make sure that uh, we're being inclusive of everyone from many different industries, not just software development or data science, you know, exclusively, because um, this 
the kind of things that we did today in the stream and just kind of in general, these are just tools. It's just like math. It's just like writing. These are tools. Um, and uh, it's one way for you to explore your industry and for you to um, better communicate with, with other people who are helping you. Um, and yeah. I could go on and on about this. Um, <laughs> I wrote a paper when I was in grad school called Computing as the Fourth R because I really, really believe that everyone, regardless of what you should you go into, needs to have a basic understanding. I don't mean everyone should be a coder at all. I mean everyone should have a basic understanding of what is powering all of these tools that we're using, whether those tools be your phone, those tools be your refrigerator, or those tools be... Um, uh, you know, machine learning models that are running uh, through your data. That's because if you have a, a general understanding of, of what's running those, uh, that'll help you interact with them better. That'll help you get help from experts better. I mean, even as simple as knowing the way that passwords, you know, are checked and knowing that, you know, capitalization matters or spaces matter or things like that and why they matter. They matter because code is dumb and it literally will just say does this string equal this string that matters um and so when i'm talking to like my mother who's having trouble uh logging into her email and she's like i'm using the same password and you know she can't figure out why it's not working and i'm like oh well you didn't capitalize this letter and you're using the password from your computer not your email um, that's because there's like a, a lack of that basic understanding of how the software is working so yeah long rants i could go on forever um if you ever want to hear just rants about <laughs> coding education, let me know. <laughs> so I'm really glad to have you here. Um, yes, I agree. Those people are rare. <laughs> All right. We're just over the two hour mark, so I'm going to stop streaming, but it was really great to have you all here. I really appreciate all of the interactions in the chat. Um, thank you, Megan and Christopher, and we'll see you again next week. Bye, everyone.